All right, welcome everybody. Hi, Don. Well, thank you. I'm gonna, it might not have been for me, but I'm going to take that applause. <laughs> um, let's see here. It's a little loud here because there's, not, there's only like half as many people here, right? Uh, I don't know what's going on in your home this week in, in terms of the weather, but I have this running battle between my two kids, our two kids. So my wife's in Hawaii, good timing, right? Um, and, uh, but my 12-year-old would never go to school again and be very happy, all right? Like he wants to play fr with friends, play games, constantly things like this, just fun stuff. Um, my, our 18-year-old, uh, who's a senior in high school, is a, uh, um, like a junior producer on a play at school, right? Really big deal for him. And they open on Thursday this week. <laughs> so they have a rehearsal tomorrow, like a tech, like go through it all the way, full dress rehearsal. And um, so I said, so how are you doing? He goes, well, you know, if school's closed tomorrow, then we won't have tech rehearsal. Uh, and I said, well, so will you go open on Thursday? He goes, yeah, but with no rehearsal. And I'm like, how are you feeling about that? And he said, I don't really, I don't want that. I really don't want that. So I'm, I like, I'm, I don't know what to do because I don't want school for my kid because I want to hang out with him and play. Uh, <laughs> But then, you know, my other kids like this, so I think I'm going to come down and like, I, I think I, I don't want it to snow anymore tonight. I just, you know, I just want it to be like two hours late, school start tomorrow, that's fine, okay, two hours late. Welcome tonight, and lots of folks who are going to be watching this, uh, this video as well, welcome. I, my goal, so nine lectures over the course of these, this series, um, is to have a new sweater each evening, okay, <laughs> all right? This is a Christmas sweater um, from 2018, but I'm just getting around to wearing it now, okay? Uh, it's about how long it usually takes me. Um, so welcome tonight. I know there's a debate. I know there's the weather and everything, so thanks for coming out tonight. Um, and I hope that this lecture will be useful for you. So just uh, as a reminder of the overview of the three, the, the three sub-lecture series, we were talking about the Democrats here in January, then we're gonna, I'm going to talk about the Republicans in April, and then I'm going to talk about what I call the nation, really the election, the whole election dynamics in the fall. Um, as we think about the first three, uh, these are the lectures. We, I talked about the National Crucible using 1864 as a reference point last time. Tonight I want to talk about nomination roadmaps, the ways in which um, candidates who are running for president have to take into account um, the, the, the kind of playing field. Uh, it isn't just be a good candidate, there's a lot of strategy that's involved here, and tonight is going to be kind of lecture one of talking about strategy, and then lecture two about talking about strategy will be when I bring in the names of people and, and kind of link uh, the actual people with some of their strategies in next Tuesday on what I call the contenders. Uh, so if the first lecture last week was big picture, really trying to put this moment historically, this moment into a bigger, broader historical context, the lecture um, tonight is what I would call a political um, lecture, looking at the ways that parties and candidates have to uh, run the, 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 the obstacle course of the nomination kind of uh, uh, field. So I call it a kind of a political lecture. And then this is really a human lecture, this last one. It's about the people that are involved um, in the process that we're right now, the ones that are involved in the process right now. So tonight, uh, the nomination roadmaps, really literally a map through the nomination field. Okay. <clears throat> Iowa. So tonight I'm going to talk a fair amount about Iowa and New Hampshire uh, with a, mm, the last kind of third of the lecture with a good chunk of South Carolina in it. These three states are four, three of the four early states that vote in the presidential primaries for both parties. And so it's important to talk about them because they're so important and determinative. So Iowa... 
um, as I will explain as we go, is the first state to vote in each of the Republican and Democratic primary, presidential primaries every year, every four years. It's the first state, and I'll share why that is um, in a few minutes. Um, but Iowa uh, has, has, in one particular year in our lifetime, since it became an import, the first state, let me say this again, since it became a first state, there was one year when Iowa was still there, it was still first, but the candidates didn't go there to compete. And it was in 1992. And in 1992, uh, Tom Harkin, an Iowa senator, was running for the presidency. So none of the Democrats who were running for the presidency in 1992 competed in Iowa. Uh, they just said, it's not worth it. We're not going to win in Iowa. Uh, you know, and in fact, strategically, they wanted to remove the victory kind of support that Harkin would get from winning there. So they didn't even want to go try. It's like saying, we're not going to win at CenturyLink so the team doesn't even come to try, right? I'm still aching over that Seahawk loss, all right? Okay. Um, but they didn't go in 1992. And of course, in 1992, on the Democratic side, Bill Clinton emerges as the nominee. This is all uh, just kind of backdrop for the fact that in 2007, when Hillary Clinton was running for the presidency, uh, she and her strategic team um, looked at Iowa, and because Bill and all of his great political talents had not really strongly competed in Iowa in 1992, Hillary Clinton did not start, or the Clintons did not start with a strong network in Iowa. And they, and they were nervous about this. They were nervous about this, knowing that it was first on the map and that Bill Clinton had never really built a support system there. Um, and so they were very concerned. So they debated, Hillary Clinton and her campaign debated whether or not um, they should compete in Iowa. And this is often a discussion among candidates. Sh should we compete in all these states? Which states should we emphasize? Which ones should we not? Maybe Iowa doesn't work for us, but can we, can we skip it? And so a very vigorous internal conversation in the Clinton campaign about whether to compete in Iowa. And they had a, uh, an aide write a memo in which he was tasked with the uh, job of making the argument to not compete in Iowa. Just like a lawyer will often be competed to make the case so that the legal team can figure out uh, which side, you know, like to, to the best arguments that the opposing side might bring. So they asked this aide to make this case um, of whether or not Hillary Clinton should compete there. And this memo had a lot in it, but I'm going to pull out a little bit here. So it's an argument to not compete in Iowa, a, basically about 10 months before the Iowa caucuses. I believe we need a new approach to winning the Democratic nomination. This approach involves shifting the focus from Iowa and running a campaign more focused on other early primary states and winning on Super Tuesday, which is a big day, a day of a lot of primaries and caucuses that comes after the early states. More specifically, I propose skipping the Iowa caucuses and dedicating more of Senator Clinton's time and financial resources on the primary in New Hampshire, the Nevada caucus, the primaries in South Carolina and Florida, and the 20 plus state primaries on February 5th. Campaigning in Iowa will, will demand Senator Clinton to spend a minimum of 75 days in over 50, 15 million. We will not have a financial or organizational advantage over our opponents. That's the reference to the, like, the fact that the Clintons were not embedded in Iowa very strongly. Worst case scenario, this effort may bankrupt the campaign and provide little of any political advantage. Last bit. We have the opportunity to change the focus from a traditional process of Iowa first to a campaign that favors us. If she walks away from Iowa, she will devalue Iowa, which is our consistently weakest state. This is a bold move that increases our momentum and improves our positioning. So, Clinton campaign writes this memo. Uh, internal debate and discussion, it's about nine months, ten months before the Iowa caucuses. Like any good political opponents, the Edwards campaign gets the memo. Okay, they get the memo and they decide to leak this memo 
so that Iowans will be pissed at Clinton that she's even considering not competing there. So the memo comes out, May 2007, and they make the argument, look, we're just discussing this. We have made no decision whatsoever. Um, this, is the, this is a perspective of an aide. We asked this person to write this up, to think about it. We have not decided. But it was a big firestorm, right? Iowa's getting pissed. Clinton, Clinton, you know, are you trying to do an end run around the process and all this? So Hillary Clinton was put in a position to have to make a decision about whether she was going to compete in Iowa. Not a careful reasoned decision, but one that was a snap decision. And so Hillary Clinton issued a statement. She said, I am unalterably committed to competing in Iowa. So once you say this, well, you are. <laughs> you are. Like, unalterably, I mean, like, you know that those message folks thought about how can we say it in, like, the strongest possible word without looking weak or defensive. Unalterably. Who uses that word, okay? <laughs> I mean, do you walk around like to my, I don't like when, if my kid's upset, I am unalterably committed to you, my son, okay? I mean, that's true, but it isn't a word we use. So Clinton, Clinton doubles down, triples down, quadruples down to compete in Iowa. And let's take as factually correct what is in that memo. They did not have a deep network in the state. It was her weakest state of the early states. And now she has made a decision to accentuate it. That is, a, that is a, uh, one of those mistakes and situations that you cannot plan for, but inevitably happen in a political campaign. And then all of a sudden, the pathway goes this way instead of like maybe this way or this way. All of a sudden, she was set up there. And OK, all right, that's a decision. It's a decision about Iowa. Meantime. There's another campaign going on, the Obama campaign. Um, and they have a strategy going on as well in early 2007. And David Pluff, who's, who's the campaign manager for the Obama campaign, wrote about all this in depth in his book, The Audacity to Win, which came out in 2009. And so Pluff talks about their strategy uh, in Iowa. Before we even knew the contours of the final primary calendar, like which ones would come first and when, we pounded Obama with the mantra that the first contest held undue influence. If you stumbled as an insurgent candidate, you were done. If you run, we told them, you are going to spend all your time doing two things, raising money and campaigning in one of these four states, most often Iowa. Though this strategy would be tested vigorously at times, in hindsight, having it pinned down and clear at the outset could not have been more important. That last little, that last sentence, including the last clause, is, is really does speak to what can make or break campaigns. Do they have a strategy that they are gonna ride with, ride through thick and thin with? And for them, they did. You're gonna raise money and you're gonna campaign in these four states, most often Iowa. Our strongest strategic sense was that Hillary Clinton had to be disrupted early in the primary season for us to have any chance of derailing her. Axe, by which he means David Axelrod. Axe and I gravitated to the same place on this pretty quickly, and the rest of the team concurred. There were no long, drawn-out discussions. We were running against such a formidable front-runner that if she won the first few contests, the race would be over. As Axe told me over a breakfast in Chicago one day during this early period, I really don't think we have a choice. It's Iowa or bust. So Obama, a senator from Illinois, geographically next door, uh, decides their campaign that it's Iowa or bust. That's really not a good way to choose a president, by the way, because no state should have that much influence. Um, and for all kinds of reasons, you know, Iowa is as flawed as any state in terms of being in that role. But it nonetheless was the case. And so the Obama campaign rolled the dice, emphasized the first four states, as all candidates do, and I'm going to talk about those four, but really emphasized Iowa. Okay? And so let's take a look. 
January 3rd, 2008, were the, two, were the uh, Democratic primary, uh, Demo yeah, Democratic presidential caucuses in Iowa. A little bit earlier in the year that earlier in the year that year, um, in the polls nationally at that time on January third, two thousand eight, this is where Barack Obama stood relative to Hillary Clinton nationally. He was down seventeen points in the polls nationally to Clinton. All right. Edwards was somewhere between that. She, he was actually a little closer, John Edwards. In Iowa, on caucus night, the results look like this. Barack Obama won by seven, eight, nine percent. I can't remember exactly. Won the caucuses. He did what they strategically set out to do. His, their approach derived the benefits and the hopes that they had. Similarly, the Clinton campaign has been proven over two presidential elections to have struggled in Iowa. She did not have the success in 2016 either that she would eventually have through the rest of the primary and caucuses season. She would win eventually fairly comfortably over Bernie Sanders. Sanders kept going and they kept kind of going like this the whole way, but she was ahead significantly, but she did not have that kind of success in Iowa. It was literally almost a tie in Iowa. Iowa, the first state in the caucuses, okay? This led Kamala Harris in 2019 to say, I am, I am fucking moving to Iowa, okay? Why? Because she wanted, her hope was to replicate the Obama success uh, with a similar coalition, her hope, highly educated whites, um, young people, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the low percentages, but, but pocketed percentage uh, of people of color in the state. For Kamala Harris, this didn't work. It actually doesn't work for most people. If you hear a candidate say, I am fucking moving to a state to win it, they're probably not gonna win it, all right? because it, 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 it has this kind of sense of like, of desperation and, and an, an altering of strategy that wasn't there to begin with, all right? Okay, so let's talk about why this is and how this works and what it means for us today in 2020. So the early states. I want to look at the ordering of states in both presidential primaries, whether it's Democrats or Republicans. What are the, what's the ordering? Why do we have the ordering this way? And what, it, what does it mean for a candidate trying to kind of like skirt through this and go through this? Okay. So the very first primary in the country was in New Hampshire in 1916. Very first um, presidential primary. And a primary, by definition, is not an election that actually gets someone to office. A primary, by definition, is an internal to a party election that helps the party to decide who's going to be the candidates in the, what's called the general election, the final election. So a primary is an election within a political party to see who's going to represent that party in the more competitive general election. In 1916, presidents did not run for the presidency the way that we're used to this today. That doesn't really happen the way we understand campaigning until about the 1950s with television and with mass media and with mass transportation systems uh, in quite the way that we, expect it, that we ex are comfortable with it today. So candidates didn't really run. Uh, and there were no primaries as we understand it. There were no like, hey, go cast a ballot in New Hampshire and then so-and-so wins the primary in New Hampshire. Instead, in 1916, what people ran for in the primary was to be a New Hampshire Democratic delegate to the National Democratic Convention. Because that's where they chose who was going to be the nominee. So it would be like all of you wanting to be a delegate to go somewhere else because 
that's where like the real action happens. Today we say, no, we're not going to have you be, try to get that vote to go somewhere else and vote. So you're going to get to directly vote. You're going to get to do that directly. But then you just wanted a ticket to get to the real big game. So if you go back to the 1916 presidential primary in the state, it's actually a presidential delegate primary, and it's names of community leaders who are running, wanting to be a delegate to the national convention. And that year, it's a Republican national convention because the presidency on the Democratic side is Woodrow Wilson running for re-election. And so there isn't really a primary going on. There aren't going to be, there's no choice to be made at the 1960 presidential Democratic convention. There is a choice to be made on the Republican side, though. So it's a bunch of community leaders who say, if you vote for me, I will go to the convention, and here's the kind of person and kind of values that I'll bring to this endeavor. All right? It started out really as a people thing, a chance for people to work in their communities, to campaign, to represent their community at some national endeavor. Well, this changes uh, slowly over time, and we get our very first kind of um, presidential primary where it's a direct vote by people on presidential candidates in 1952. So coming out of the... Uh, the 1940s and the very contested presidential election of 1948 of Dewey and Truman, New Hampshire says, what if we create a primary, again, within a party, an election, to see who's going to represent that party? What if we do that in 1952 um, and we, we have it for both the Republicans and the Democrats and we have a primary and we allow people who are uh, citizens of the state to vote directly upon the presidential candidates and pick a New Hampshire primary winner. What if we did that? So they do this in 1952. No idea how it's going to go, whether people are going to come out, if they're going to be interested or not. So in 1952, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who becomes the Republican nominee, eventually says, I'm not going to, this is beneath me. I am not going to put my name on the ballot. This is not what I the greatest general in American history, does. Put my name on a primary ballot? I'm not going to do this. So he refused to do it. And then won big in a write-in vote on the Republican side, which is a really good strategic move, okay, to do that. On the Democratic side, the sitting president at the time was Harry Truman. And Harry Truman had barely won re-election in 1948 and was not clear on whether he was going to run again. He was legally able to run again, you can be elected twice as a president. He had ascended to the presidency when FDR died in office in 1945. So Truman could run. He ran in 48, and he could run again in 52 if he wanted to. Um, he was waffling on this, but he said, I'll, I'll, I'll run, okay. And there was a, a senator, I mean, I'll put my name on the, the primary, and we'll just see how this goes. And there was a senator in Tennessee, um, Estes Kefauver, who was a liberal Tennessean, and Kefauver uh, really opposed um, kind of U.S. involvement in the Korean War. So he, he ran against this, ran against Truman on this. And uh, Kefauver did not beat Truman, but he came very close to beating Truman in New Hampshire. And Truman decided right after that, I'm not running for president. I'm not. If I can't win my own primary as a sitting president in this state uh, up here, this kind of New England bastion of, of like moderate Republican and Democraticism, then I'm not going to run. So he, he decided not to run. So he had this great impact of, the, Demo of the, uh, the primary in New Hampshire. And all of a sudden, New Hampshire's like, this is gold. This is really interesting. This is Fascinating. We're gonna we're gonna invest in this thing. We're gonna make it a make it a business up here. This primary. So in 1952, we have the first one, and the outcome is a big deal. Okay. All right. In 1968, by not by about by 1968, the number of states that have primaries or caucuses in either the Republican or Democratic Party, the number of states is about one third of all states by 1968. What's going on with the other two-thirds? The other two-thirds are internal party leadership, 
who are picking their friends to be delegates, go to the national convention, strike deals, and backroom deals, and pick the nominee. This is what's going on. So in about a third of states, there's, dem there's primaries and caucuses, and in about two-thirds of all states, they're still not by 1968. New Hampshire's the first but, uh, in the calendar, but a lot of them still don't have it. In 1968, Hubert Humphrey only runs in about half of the primaries on the Democratic side. Uh, you have Eugene McCarthy early on. Some of you, <clears throat> let's just see. Uh, okay. Anybody in here campaign in 1968? Yeah, 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 right? Gene McCarthy was out there, right? Right, you were for Gene? Yep. Clean Gene. And uh, it was contested, you know, around the anti-war situation and the whole country was on fire, like now. And then you have Martin Luther King Jr. assassinated in April, and you have Bobby Kennedy getting in the campaign uh, in late March when the Lynn Johnson decides not to run for re-election. That was a hell of an election year, right? You all know this. And well, some of you know this. Well, we may all know this. Some of you were there, okay? Um, so Johnson decides not to run for re-election. You got McCarthy in the New Hampshire primary in 1968. McCarthy doesn't beat Johnson, but he comes close, scares the crap out of Johnson. Johnson decides he's not going to run. Bobby Kennedy throws his hat into the ring in uh, late March, decides to run. Uh, and I I've consist consistently get kind of two schools of thought on Kennedy, There's, on Bobby Kennedy. There are the people who say like he's the greatest and he was an incredible inspirational figure and you know he was the, the, the Kennedy that really was the most committed to issues of justice. And then I get others who talk to me, who I hear or I read, who say like he was an opportunist. He was cold-blooded, he was Kennedy-esque, all of this. Didn't get into the election until it seemed like he, he had a shot, like didn't put his capital on the line. So Kennedy gets in the election in March. Uh, Humphrey runs in about half of them. Kennedy wins a few, gets to California, wins the primary, and is killed that night, assassinated that night in June. Um, and you may well remember all that. It was a devastating time. We get all the way to the fall, to the summer, when it's the convention for the Democrats, and it's in Chicago, right? And it just goes to hell, right? You have fights, literal fist fights on the floor of the convention. You have uh, the, the protesters in the streets. You have the police. You have national television kind of finding its way as a, as a kind of uh, broadcast phenomenon. It just goes to hell and there's so much controversy over the fact that Humphrey secures the nomination. That coming out of this in 1968, the Democratic Party says this doesn't work. We're going to reform. We're going to create a new process to how we're going to decide our presidential candidate. We're going to create a new process. And it's going to be a publicly transparent process. That's the language they use, a publicly transparent process. And what they said, what they said is every state is going to have to declare publicly how they select their nominee for that state. There are three ways that can be done, they decide. There can be a primary where everybody, everybody who's a member of the party um, gets a chance to vote. It can be a caucus where everybody gets to come on special, not, special times of the day to come and vote. Or there can be a statewide convention, but that has to be open to people. Okay? They create this commission. It takes months to figure this all out. And there's one, uh, the name of the commission is uh, the McGovern-Fraser Commission. So George McGovern gets to create the process. Perfect for him. So then 1972, he uses it to his advantage, right? But they decide every state's going to have a primary, a caucus, or a state convention that's open to people, OK? So here's what happens in 1972. And you know, this is more information that you were expecting on the primaries and the caucuses, I know. <laughs> but this is the kind of structural stuff that actually defines our political system. So it isn't just us showing up to vote or not vote. There's massive structural system elements that drive our system. 
So in that reform commission in 1968 that takes a couple of years to get all things figured out, um, it, things have to be publicly transparent. And some of the most diehard liberals committed to reform in, this, in the presidential uh, 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 selection process are in Iowa. And in Iowa, they decide, you know what? We need to uh, be so publicly transparent in this process that we need to have a, a precinct convention where people get to vote, followed by a district convention where the precinct delegates who are selected at that get to come and vote, followed by county conventions where everybody who's a delegate at the, pre at the precinct, the district level, gets to come to, followed by a state convention. This is classic progressivism, right? <laughs> right, every step of the way. So they're gonna have precinct, district, county, state, and they decide there needs to be a month in between. So they simply look at the calendar and they say, we gotta have this done at least a month before the, uh, the national convention, so let's just work backwards in time. So one month, one month, earlier in time. One month, one month, one month, one month. And this is how Iowa becomes first in 1972. Not any strategy, not any, any uh, strategic sense of what's going on. And New Hampshire says, you can't be first, we're first. <laughs> New Hampshire says, hell no, you can't be first. Our identity's wrapped up in first. And so Iowa says, we won't do a primary because you're the first in the nation primary. We'll, be, we'll do a caucus. It's cool, right? We'll do a caucus. You do a primary, they're not the same thing, and you will not lose your standing as the first in the nation primary. And, and New Hampshire says, we're good. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so if you follow on Twitter anything about New Hampshire, there is hashtag FITN, first in the nation. Okay, That is wrapped into the New Hampshire identity. Iowa gets to go before them because they didn't take that primary away. They're a caucus. So Iowa is a caucus. They go first in 1972, no specific plan. It's all entirely to have these month increments as they go. So in 1976, Iowa and New Hampshire are first. Iowa is the caucus, New Hampshire is the primary. And there's a stunning result. On the Democratic side, this guy from Georgia, who's the governor, comes up to, Georgia, to Iowa and becomes the, not, the selection, the first, first selection in Iowa, and then in New Hampshire, Jimmy Carter. And it's a stunner, and it's dramatic, and the media love it, and the Iowans are fired up and excited, and New Hampshire's really pleased too because they're still the first in the nation primary, and the Iowa caucuses are this quaint little thing, because there's a real big rivalry between these two. These are quaint little caucuses. They all, in New Hampshire, they say, you grow corn, you know, we grow a president here in New Hampshire, all right? And so the reality is that they, they, they kind of live with it and they accept it, but this big stunner result, and both of them, and so New Hampshire's always been committed to being first. Iowa says, hell, we like this. We really like being first. Who else? The national media do not come to Des Moines most of the time, but they're there now. The national media all have several media journalists, several journalists who have been embedded in campaigns in Iowa for months. You cannot turn on the television in Iowa without advertisement after advertisement after advertisement. All right? So in New Hampshire in 1979, and then Iowa firms it up in 2007, now have state laws. Let's say they must go first. New Hampshire, after 1976, said, you know, Iowa had that incredible result in 1976. We gotta make sure they don't become bigger than us, so we're gonna make sure that we're first in the nation. And Iowa passed a similar law in 2007. Iowa was able to go first. New Hampshire allows them to go first, um, as long as they're not a primary. And by state laws, this is what I mean. They, the, the Secretary of State in each state is required by state law to set the date of the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary so that no one goes before them. And this is why in 2008, the Iowa caucuses were on January 3rd. Because in that year, a couple states tried to springboard, uh, get in front of them, and they both basically gave them the finger. 
and said, do you want to do that? We'll just move ahead of you. We'll just keep moving ahead of you. So each state is determined to be first. All right? So that's why it is. They are first. Now, those are states. The parties could still say, no, we're done. The states, the parties could say, that's nice that you've got those laws, but we think we want to do something different. But each party is concerned about doing that because they feel if they do it and the other party doesn't do it, they'll lose that state. And these two states have been swing states. So the Democrats are concerned that if they turn their back and walk away from Iowa and the Republicans don't, then those Iowans will never forgive them. Because it is literally millions of dollars. And same thing with New Hampshire. And New Hampshire swings back and forth as a state. So each party has got these incentives to stay and also is afraid of being the one that departs. OK. So this leads to us starting to turn and to go into the next phase of this lecture, which is, OK, if those two states are early, if they're first, does it matter? Does it make much of a difference in who becomes the nominee? Okay. Carter goes on to be president of the United States. Reagan goes on to be president of the United States. So I'm just going to list the people that became president. Uh, Reagan was two-term president, but I'm just interested in the first year that they run. So in 1980, Reagan wins as president. In 1988, George H.W. Bush wins. In 1992, Clinton wins. 2000. George W. Bush, 2008, Barack Obama. Deep breath. <laughs> okay, Trump, really, this is an embarrassment. I mean, this really is. Donald Trump is president of the United States. It really is. If he, if he, if he was president of like another country that we deeply respected, we would all be just, it'd be like, we would lose a lot of respect for them. But, I, I, I'm sorry, I digress, okay? <laughs> all of these people are the people that went on to be president. Obama wins again in 2012, I know, but I'm only interested in the first year that they run. How'd they do in these two states? How'd they do in these two states? Jimmy Carter, I've already mentioned, Jimmy Carter wins both states. Pretty unknown governor of uh, a southern state. Hadn't had um, uh, a Democratic southerner um, uh, uh, from, you know, outside of Lyndon Johnson who had come in after JFK, run on his own and become president in a long time. He wins. Surprising. Now, he's got an asterisk in 1976. Because in 1976, as today, you have an ability on the Iowa ballot, whether you're on the Democratic or Republican primary, to select none of the above. You have the ability to do that. And that means you don't want anybody that's on that ballot. In 1976, none of the above got 35% of the vote. OK? So Carter, Carter was number one on the, pers the people who got selected. OK? But he still got all this attention because he was coming out of nowhere and he was running on this integrity and this honesty platform which really mattered post Watergate. Um, and then he obviously does win in New Hampshire. And I think we just need to pause for a second. He's a Democratic governor from Georgia who wins in New Hampshire. That, that's not that expected at that time. All right, so he wins them both. In 1980, Ronald Reagan, he loses um, in Iowa uh, to, if I'm correct on this, George H.W. Bush. Not positive on that, though. Uh, but then wins in New Hampshire. <clears throat> and if I'm also correct, I believe he fires his campaign manager between. I believe that's so. And, and then kind of writes the ship and goes on to, to win the nomination. In 1988, George H.W. Bush is third in Iowa That's the year Pat Robertson won in Iowa. And then he wins in New Hampshire. In 1992, Clinton doesn't run in, in, 
Iowa, as I told you, because Tom Harkin was running. So they don't compete. And then he's what I call seconds in, uh, in New Hampshire. So I know this is bringing back some memories and all my colleagues over here are still before your lifetime. That's fine. But the reality is that uh, those of you who recall, uh, Clinton doesn't run in 1992 in Iowa, but does run. And, you know, he's got so many scandals that just kind of roll off, roll one another. And so he has this famous 60 Minutes interview with his wife, Hillary Clinton, um, in which he's defending his marital relation, his, mar his marriage. Um, he's uh, articulating wh whether he ever inhaled or didn't inhale marijuana, all of this stuff, right? And so he, he falls way behind in the polls in New Hampshire. And Paul Songus is a senator from Massachusetts, next door. And Songus wins. But because Songus is next door in the same way that Tom Harkin was in Iowa, Songus doesn't get a lot of credit for winning it. And Clinton is second. But he spins it beautifully because this is what he does. As like he really won. Like, you know, I came from so far behind and, and we lost to this guy who's like the, the, the local favorite. He goes, so, and then he gives a famous speech in which he brands himself. I mean, and this is just such chutzpah. In which he brands himself the comeback kid, right? Yeah. Brands himself as the comeback kid. And so he spins it as first. And um, at the end of my lecture tonight, I'm going to mention a guy by the name of David Horsey. <laughs> wow, Okay. Um, well, I know David, and uh, <laughs> David uh, is a, an alum of the University of Washington's Department of Communication and is also a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner for his political cartoons, and David and I have had the, the joy and fun of traveling to some presidential states during primaries, and David tells this great story about going to New Hampshire in 1992 and covering it for the PI, for the Post-Intelligencer, and going to a mall to buy a shirt, because he needed a shirt, he, like his luggage got hung up or something. So he went to a mall to buy a shirt. And when, as he walked into the mall, in New, it's the middle of winter, freezing, it's the, week, the days before the New Hampshire primary, he walks in and Bill Clinton is in the mall, standing there shaking anybody's hand who will come by. And nobody's talking to Bill Clinton, all right? This is the man who goes on to be president of the United States, right? He's in the middle of a mall, just wanting to talk to anybody. And it's at kind of his toughest moments in the election, in the campaign, but he never quit. He never gave up. And Horsey says he walks right on past him to get this shirt, and he spins around. And he's like, Bill Clinton, what are you doing right here? And he goes, I'm just meeting people. And, you know, doing this, right? And, and this, is, this is classic, like, New Hampshire, Iowa. Uh, retail politics. So Clinton spins it in 1992 as first. In 2000, Bush wins in Iowa, is second to John McCain in New Hampshire. In 2008, Barack Obama wins in Iowa, is second to Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire. And in 2016, Donald Trump is second to Ted Cruz in Iowa, and then wins really big in New Hampshire. So when you look at this, it doesn't take, you know, I'm a social scientist, I pay a lot of attention to evidence and data, but it doesn't take a brilliant social scientist to figure out that these seem to matter. These states seem to matter. Like you don't have seventh on here. You don't have like 15th. You have first, seconds, and one third on here. All right? So these states really matter. They really matter. They, in, presidential, in political presidential language, they do what's called winnow the field. They winnow the field. People drop out. All right. Now, there are so many issues and concerns with Iowa and New Hampshire being first like this. Uh, I'm just going to hit on a couple. First of all is the racial composition of those states. The, the who, who are the citizens of the state? Not that these people are bad because of the racial composition, but if they get to be first all the time, it's important for us to look at like who's there. 
Iowa's the sixth whitest state in the country. New Hampshire's the third whitest state in the country. This is, this is going to sound snide, but it's not. That's fine for the Republicans. Because as I'll talk about in April, their electoral coalition is, is, is predominantly white, overwhelmingly so. But on the Democratic side, not remotely close. What about the population size of this, of these states? Well, Iowa's the 31st largest state. It's just roughly, you know, about the size of Seattle and Tacoma. And New Hampshire's the 42nd. It's about the size of Seattle. I mean, King County is 2 million. So New Hampshire's, you know, smaller than King County population-wise. Just imagine if King County, every four years, got to be the second location in this country, right? That got to pick the, you know, this. That's, that's both absurd to even imagine, and also, why the hell not, right? Why the hell not? We're the only county in the country that's actually named in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Right? I was going to mention this next week. I can mention it here. We weren't originally so, but we are now in honor of Dr. King. So that's as good a reason to me as, as New Hampshire. You know, I think wait a minute, way better reason than New Hampshire. And then third, there's monopolistic privileges that come with having the first, the knowing, being certain that these candidates are going to come to your state every four years and not just for a week not just for a month, but for months and months and months. So a couple quotes captured this kind of the implications of this. In 2000, I'm sorry, 1987, Al Gore said, there's something wrong. Okay? In 2000, when he ran against Bill Bradley, he stood on the stage in Iowa and said, I love the Iowa caucuses. <laughs> but in 1987, when he was getting beat by, um, who was winning in 1988 in Iowa? I don't know who won. Dukakis didn't win there, I'm pretty sure of that, because he wins in New Hampshire the next week. I'll have to look that up, who won in 1988 in the Iowa caucuses. Gore says there's something wrong. In 2007, Joe Biden says this isn't a caucus, it's an industry. Yeah, that's why he got no percentage votes in 2007 saying this, okay? And then this time around, Julian Castro has been an outspoken critic. Now, Julian Castro has dropped out in the last week and a half or two weeks. Um, but before that, before he dropped out, he was a critic of the primaries. And I want to show you, of, of the Iowa caucuses. But it's also, I'm sorry, Iowa and New Hampshire. And I just want to show you... Um, just a little clip of what he had to say. That, um, that we do need to change. Uh, I actually believe that um, that we do need to change uh, the order of the states because I don't believe that uh, that we're the same country we were in 1972. That's when Iowa first held its caucus first, and by the time we have the next presidential election in 2024, it'll have been more than 50 years since 1972. Our country has changed a lot in those 50 years. Uh, the Democratic Party has changed a lot. What I really appreciate about Iowans and the folks in New Hampshire is that they take this process very seriously. Mm -hmm. They vet the candidates, they show up at town halls, they give people a good hearing. At the same time, demographically, it's not reflective of 
the United States as a whole, certainly not reflective of the Democratic Party, and I believe that other states should have their chance. Uh, so yes, of course, we need to find other states, uh, and that doesn't mean that Iowa and New Hampshire can't still play an important role, right. but I don't believe that forever we should be married to Iowa and New Hampshire going first, and that's just the truth of the way that I see it. I totally agree. I 100% agree. Uh, and every year there's a couple candidates who make that argument. It does seem to have reached a bit of a tipping point this year, though. The critiques of the, the, the final set of candidates on the Democratic side as um, at least them themselves being uh, all white um, and of a certain kind of older age population. Um, so, I, you know, maybe, maybe, but I know that there's been critiques of the, of the uh, caucuses and the primary being the first two for some time, so I don't know. All right, so in response to some of these criticisms over the years, the two, de the the two major parties, the Republicans and Democrats, came together in 2008 and said, all right, all right, together, because neither one of them wanted to abandon Iowa or New Hampshire by themselves, together we'll agree upon what we call carve-out states. We'll carve out dates in the calendar for four early states. They will get protected status on the, the uh, presidential primary calendar every year. So there's four of them, and we're going to select them to have a more diverse set of uh, voters. So Iowa New Hampshire gets to stay, but they added Nevada, and they added South Carolina, four carve-out states, and that's where we're at today. These four states get to go first. They get to go first. Any other state, whichever year it is, so let's, in 2016, each, each party had a primary, um, but this year there's just the Democratic primary. Any state that leapfrogs forward above these can do it. They can do it, but they suffer penalties in the Democratic Party. They lose all or half of their national delegates, okay, if they do this. And so in 2008, there were huge battles, and this is part of what led to the, the famous set of delegate battles between Obama and Clinton. Because Michigan leapfrogged, and Clinton and Obama didn't equally contest it because one said, you know what, they're going to lose all their delegates, we're not going to compete there. Florida leapfrogged, and one of them didn't contest it. So when we got to the end, they were arguing about how many of those delegates should count or not count. All right. Today, those four carve-out states are, are uh, uh, respected, the rules, by the other states because they don't want to lose their delegates to the National Convention. Part of the penalties in 2008 where you lost a certain number of delegates and your state because your state party sets the date of the primaries in concert with the state secretary of state. So you would lose some delegates and you would get moved to the farthest place in the, st in the arena, all right? The worst seats in the arena. Those, this is really bitter internal politics. Like you want to be, if you're a state, you want to be up close, you want to be on television, you want to raise that big pole for your state, right? That's when I think I became a junkie on politics in 2008, when I was watching the delegate arguments. It was good stuff. <laughs> so here's the first two states, and then they're followed by these states in this order. I want to talk about these four states. Um, everybody knows Iowa's first. New Hampshire's, I mean, Iowa's first caucus, New Hampshire's first in the nation primary, and then Nevada, uh, who I'm going to talk about, and they do a caucus, and then South Carolina, which does a primary. Uh, Nevada often gets just kind of dropped out of people's thinking. It has never really had the same kind of political standing as the, other, the others. And one of the persons I follow on Twitter, this guy, John Ralston, who is the kind of like the uber veteran of New ha Nevada uh, journalism, has a hashtag that I've been following him like for, since Twitter came around. The hashtag is hashtag we matter, all right? Because 
poll after poll will be like Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. And they'd be like, I think you missed one. All right, Nevada. Nevada's number three. So what I want to talk is a little bit about each of these. Because can, we can level lots of critiques, and I just leveled some. But to run the gauntlet of all of these is not easy. All right? And it, it's a very flawed and imperfect system. But it does have certain challenges to it that make someone have to be uh, of a certain kind of caliber of a candidate to win. So Iowa and New Hampshire primarily white, like 90 plus percent white. Nevada, one third Latinx. So they're in the Democratic Party um, in particular. Um, there's a large voting population um, that are Latino, um, particularly based in uh, Las Vegas and in Reno. Um, so there's a large pop, and there's about 15% that are African American in the state. And then South Carolina, it's primarily a black population in the Democratic Party. So today, now I'm just shifting to the Democratic Party for this slide. Um, about 60, 60 to 70 percent of the voters in the South Carolina primary will be African American. Um, it is the second largest overall composition of African Americans in the country on a state basis. So the state itself is the second largest percentage of African Americans. Mississippi is the largest. South Carolina is the second. And in the Democratic primary, um, the party itself in the state of South Carolina is primarily black. Actually, when you look at like South Carolina and Mississippi, what you see is 90% of whites are Republican and 90% of African Americans are Democratic. So the partisan racial intertwining in those states is really profound. So in South Carolina, most of the voters will be African American in the Democratic primary. So, you know, it, there's some diversity built into this in terms of the populations, but let's never ever lose our sense of like who gets to go first though. <laughs> At a minimum, they could, if they're gonna have to have these four, they could rotate the four. I wanna talk a little bit about each of them because they get complicated though once you look at who gets to participate in these endeavors. So in Iowa, they do a caucus one evening. Um, the Washington State, state of Washington has long time had caucuses. How many of you have ever been to a caucus? Okay, so yeah, you're not normal, okay? <laughs> uh, you're not. If you've been to a caucus in this state, you're one of about, oh, 12% of the state population, right? First caucus I ever went to was in 2008. Went down the street to my house and it was then when I said democracy is fucked, all right? Because <laughs> caucuses are just nuts, all right? Uh, I don't, you know, um, and <laughs> they do it in one evening. One of the great critiques of Iowa is not only is it overwhelmingly white, they give you about two hours to vote on a Monday night in winter <laughs> and say, go for it. So, okay, that's what their method is. That's the method that they've agreed upon with New Hampshire. If they do this method, New Hampshire says, you can go first. Otherwise, we're going to jump it because our state secretary of state will demand that we do this. So they do a caucus one evening in the middle of the winter, and it's coming up on February 3rd, uh, which is what? Today is the, the 14th. Three weeks, three weeks from today, okay? In New Hampshire, which, so the caucus in Iowa is on a Monday. New Hampshire, as part of its state law, this is, <laughs> as part of its state law, also requires not only that it be first, but that the Iowa caucus not be within seven days before it, because they want the full national attention there. So the Iowa, the New Hampshire primary is on the Tuesday, eight days after, this is why Iowa caucuses are on a Monday, so that New Hampshire can have their primary on the damn Tuesday, because Tuesday's a usual voting date. I know, this is way too much information, I know. I know, but this is like, I'm like a, yeah, I'm just crazy, okay? They do a primary, and it's on a weekday. And a primary means you get to vote for many hours. Polls open at a certain time, they stay open all day long. In Iowa, you get, two hours to do it. In New Hampshire, it's open all day long and you get to vote. 
you can go in and vote. I forgot one thing about Iowa. They got this really crazy rule in Iowa called the 15% rule. Um, why they have this, I will not, I will spare you why they have this rule. But the rule goes like this. When you go into a room to caucus, you declare the candidate you're for. They then assess the entire room. And of all the people in the room, if there is a cluster that's for a particular candidate and they do not get up to 15% of the people in the room, they are forced to reallocate. They do not get to stand there and say, hey, we're only 5%, but we are for candidate X. Nope. It's called the 15% viability threshold. So you go into a caucus and you're like, I am for Joe Biden. And in that room, it's an overwhelmingly Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar room. And let's say there's 10,000 people in that room. But of that 10,000 people, the people for Biden are less than 15%. They are forced to either leave or to reallocate. So Iowa has a two-hour voting window, and, and the only ones that ever count ultimately in the caucus are when there's 15-plus percent of people in a room. Otherwise, folks' numbers don't stand. They don't count. Okay? This year, for the very first time in Iowa caucus history, they are going to report the incoming vote preferences of people. They've never done that. They've only always reported the outgoing vote preferences after the 15% reallocation. There is a decent chance that in Iowa this year, we will have two winners. We'll have somebody that wins the incoming vote preference, and we will have somebody else who wins after all those reallocations. Okay, good stuff. And so New Hampshire has a primary on a weekday, all day long. Nevada has a caucus that lasts four days. <laughs> Nevada truly does not know what it's doing, all right? <laughs> I've been there in 2012 for the Republican primary in the Nevada caucuses, and I was there and observed a caucus site, which, quick aside, was at the synagogue that Sheldon Adelson r runs it was at his caucus, I mean at his synagogue. Uh, he was a big Newt Gingrich supporter, and he had a synagogue. Yeah. So anyways, he had a caucus there. We went and watched him. They literally collected ballots in a cardboard box and walked up and down aisles collecting them. Nevada does a caucus over four days. What does that mean? Well, because so many workers in Nevada uh, work certain hourly shifts, and are not able to physically kind of move in the same way. The notion of having it at a certain time, at like, in, like they do in Iowa, has been rejected by the, Iowa, by the Nevada Democrats. And so they have caucuses, short caucus windows over four days. Uh, it starts, they have early voting caucuses. They have the day of voting caucus in Nevada. Um, and then in South Carolina, they have a primary, and it's on a Saturday. All day on a Saturday. It's the Saturday before Super Tuesday, which follows on the following Tuesday when a whole bunch of states vote. This is at the end of February. This is in the middle of February. That's uh, New Hampshire this year is February 3rd to 7th, 11th. So February 3rd is Iowa. The 11th is New Hampshire. Nevada is the following Saturday. And then South Carolina is the last Saturday of the month. So the methods are different. You have a caucus in like a certain span of time on a Monday evening in winter. You have a primary all day in New Hampshire. You have caucus over four days. Uh, and then you have, and a lot of those caucuses in Nevada, by the way, are on the strip, and they are in casinos. So they're in worker spaces, because many Democrats work in those casinos. And then there's a primary on Saturday in New South Carolina. So this is really complicated stuff. So if you're a candidate, you've got to be able to run all the way through this. You've got to be able to win these different methodologies. All right, one last thing I want to talk about for each of them. In the Iowa caucus, the only people that can come into the door are people who sign an affidavit that say, I am a member of this political party this year. An affidavit is a legally binding document. So you can lie, of course, but then you get impeached. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. 
<laughs> Not necessarily, apparently, okay? Uh, no, you can lie, but you're lying. You're lying under the law. So you sign an affidavit. Literally, you do not go in the door of the many caucus sites unless you sign that affidavit. So I, uh, uh, who have, have not been on site in Iowa, but from people I know, they have been told you don't get to get in the door unless you're gonna sign this affidavit. So you gotta claim you're a Democrat to go into the Democratic caucuses. So only partisans. In New Hampshire, they allow part, people who are partisans and claim to be of that party, but also people who are independent, but not people of the other party, to vote. So in New Hampshire, the independents every year swing from election to election. That's why John McCain did so well in 2008 in that state. All right, and Bernie Sanders did much better in 2016 when there were independents who were allowed to vote in primaries. Most of the primaries that Bernie Sanders won had independents who could vote in the primaries. So in New Hampshire, partisans and independents can vote. Only partisans in Iowa for the caucuses. In Nevada, anybody. <laughs> anybody can come in. They just have to show a driver's license that shows that they're a Nevada state resident. You can walk in. And you can caucus. And in South Carolina, it's open to anybody. for a primary. It's open to anybody there. So the primary in New Hampshire is only open to partisans, Democrats in this case, and independents. In South Carolina, it's open to anybody. So when you look at this full map, or this full puzzle board, and you get it, you, it is the case, that although imperfect, it is require a candidate that can maneuver and navigate a lot of different places. And you don't have to win them all, but you have to like do well enough through these first four, all right? So I think it's reasonable to say like it's challenging to get through this. It's, it's not easy to get through this. I just wanted to use that. that uh, <laughs> there's nothing there. It's just a big, you know, okay. Yeah. Because you got to go through all of this to get through the first four. And then after the first four, what you're really doing is running a national primary. People are running and there are multiple states voting. There are multiple states voting every day there's a vote. The advertising costs in those states to do all of these different states after this are very high. They're quite substantial. So what you can do as a candidate is run on a reasonable financial platform across these states. These four, and that's the argument that the parties make, is that they first say, we have diversified these this to some degree. Second, look at the different methodologies that are present in these votings. And third, they say, we do need to create a system where somebody can campaign and get a chance without having massive advertising dollars to run in states across the country. All right? Okay, I'm almost done. So I wanna take the, uh, the, the nominees and look at these states again. I've already gone through all of this with you. Here's the president, the people who went on to become president. Here's how they did in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, obviously very important to do well in these states. Um, South Carolina, I want to add here. South Carolina creates its Republican primary in 1980, arguing that as the Republican Party became more anchored in the South, that it was important for the Republican primary to have a Southern primary. Okay, I buy that logic in terms of the party. So they created a primary in 1980, and then the Democrats followed suit in 1990, uh, 1988 with a primary in the state. So remember, it goes in order, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, but Nevada has always been kind of Got, gets some attention, but not as much. It just doesn't know how to run the system. It just, the state is such an odd state in terms of its, its kind of a dominant population. It's in really two places. And the whole kind of, a, I've been to the caucuses in Nevada. And in Nevada, the way, it, like, well, I should, let me say it this way. In Iowa, the whole state for about a year plus takes it really seriously. The caucuses are like, it's it. In New Hampshire, same thing. In Nevada, they don't even know there's a caucus going on, all right? Like the people who do are the diehards. The rest of the place is like, yeah, I don't, is there something going on? I don't know, all right? 
In South Carolina, it's really serious too. They take it very seriously. So I just want to focus on these three states. Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. I've told you how important Iowa and New Hampshire are, but let's look at how important South Carolina is. It comes fourth in the carve-out states. So it's the fourth of the carve-out states before we get into a national primary. In 1976, um, there wasn't one on the Democratic side, okay? In 1980, there was one on the Republican side and Reagan won. In 1988, there was one on the Republican side and it is in, in South Carolina in 1988 when the Bush campaign's uh, supportive pol political action committee runs the, the infamous Willie Horton ad in South Carolina and Bush wins. In 1992, Clinton has come in, you know, second in New Hampshire, um, and he wins in South Carolina. In 2000, Bush has gotten beat really badly in New Hampshire by John McCain, goes down there and runs an absolutely brutal scorched earth campaign against John McCain. Uh, really one of the low marks of the Bush kind of legacy. The Bushes do not have a good legacy at all in South Carolina for their politics, and he wins, beats McCain. That's McCain's low moment, I think, politically, too. That's in 2008, McCain is asked, do you think they should take down the Confederate flag from the front of the state capitol? And McCain says, no, I think they should get to decide what they want. He later says it's, it's the moment of his political career that he regretted, saying that, that he sold his soul at that moment to try to win in South Carolina. Bush wins. In 2008, Barack Obama goes there and he wins. In 2016, Donald Trump goes there and wins. I've been to South Carolina in 2012 during the primary. Uh, the Republican, it was the Republican primary because Obama, there wasn't one on the Democratic side. Um, Newt Gingrich won it in 2012 on the Republican side. It was a fascinating thing. Um, what an, an interesting place to be um, at the time. He didn't go on to become president, of course. So the way to not say this is that everybody who wins the South Carolina primary becomes president. That's not the way to say it. The way to say this is that no one has become president without winning the South Carolina primary. Why is that? Well, on the Republican side, South Carolina has really three pockets of Republicans. They have the social conservatives, they have the coastal conservatives who are more kind of moderate and, and businessy, and then they have a really strong national security thrust in the state too, okay? Some bases, some military bases. These are the three prongs of the Republican Party. Social conservatives, fiscal conservatives, and national uh, foreign policy conservatives. So on the Republican side, to thread the needle there, they're all white. That's a different issue. Ideologically though, to thread the needle there, you gotta be able to, to, approve, to appeal to these multiple ones. On the Democratic side, you've got um, the, white, the white people who are democratic are either really working class or they're highly educated. And then there's a large chunk of African Americans. And nationally, the African American uh, population is the strongest supporting uh, democratic bloc that there is. So to win out of South Carolina means that you can win the coalition that it takes for the Democrats to win it all. Okay? It doesn't mean you're going to win it all, but it says you've got the ability to do it. All right. Let's see, what do I got left here? So if you want to get to the White House, it is a reality in America today, the road to the White House is going to go through these states. That's, that's how you get to the White House. That's the map that is there. You go through these three states. You might be in Nevada as well, but you certainly go through these three states. And it's an incredible privilege to be in those states 
and to have that much attention. There's financial value, there's political value. Certain policies do not occur or do occur in this country at the national level because the candidates have to give so much attention to Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina that they've become versed on those in certain ways and they care about them and they know that that, those, that state sprung them to the national arena, all right? So to get there, it goes through these states. There is a joke in New Hampshire that is both funny and sad in which a voter is asked by a candidate, I mean, this is an apocryphal joke, but I'm sure it's there, is that a voter is asked by a candidate, are you going to vote for me? In which the voter says, I don't know, I've only met you three times. <laughs> okay? What an incredible privilege that is to be there, to be able to meet these candidates and to look them in the eye and to shake their hands or to take the measure of them. And that's where the debate is tonight in Iowa. The debate, Democratic Party debate today is in Iowa. There'll be one in, the, in South Carolina before the South Carolina primary. So I'm going to finish this lecture by um, saying to you, I want to invite you to potentially join us on a 2020 presidential tour. I'm here to see if you would be interested in coming. This is what it is. You want to travel, see, hear, and maybe meet the 2020 Democratic Party presidential candidates? This happens only for the few in our state. But in the early primary election states, all can do this. Join us to travel to Iowa or South Carolina to experience the candidates in first-hand ways rather than solely through news coverage, to feel the energy of the voters on the ground, to see news media doing their stuff, and to experience it all in real time. It's democracy at its rawest and on the fly. Choose each day from a curated menu of candidate events or head out on your own. Also, we will devote one day in which each of us volunteers for a candidate of our choice. This is the dates of the trip to Iowa. It's coming up quick. And this is the dates of the trip to South Carolina, about four weeks later, late February. I'm going to hold conference calls Thursday evening and Saturday morning if you're interested in this. All proceeds will go to support the work of this organization that I work with called Common Purpose. This is a fundraiser for our work. So I, I want you to know that, okay? It's an educational experience, it's open. We have a, about three or four seats maximum left on our Iowa trip. We've got about 20 people signed up right now. Um, and we got about 20 signed up on South Carolina, but we can take a few more because the, the state is a little easier to navigate. Um, so we would be really interested in having you join us. If you, wanted, if you want more information, you can join me on a conference call. I have flyers right up here. And when I decided I wanted to leave the University of Washington, um, I wanted to do a lot of civic work, uh, really important work, but I also wanted to have some incredibly fun experiences. And there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of fun and going there and seeing this in person and also seeing our, our kind of Democratic candidates up close and personal um, while also fighting the fight. Nothing wrong with that. So if you're interested, pick up a flyer. Um, the costs are high. This is at an end of a continuum because it's a fundraiser for us. We'd love to have you. This is where we're going to be. Uh, I'm going to be there. I'm gonna, we're going to be there leaving on the 28th for Iowa. If you're interested and ever want to see this, this is the moment. We have, what, six candidates on the debate stage tonight? Five? Six? It's not guaranteed that one of them will be the, the nominee, but it's highly likely and they'll be, can they'll be campaigning all over the states, each of these states. Also campaigning all over these states will be the surrogates of these candidates. So a lot of folks who support them will be there. Um, and on the South Carolina trip, David Horsey will be joining us as well. <laughs> and David will be doing kind of nightly discussions about his cartoons and the work that he's doing. He's gonna draw a cartoon and as part of your coming and doing this, as a, to support it as a fundraiser for Common Purpose, you're gonna get your own cartoon that David's gonna draw. Um, so we're, we're, I'm in it for the fun, but I'm also in it for the education and in it for the way that this supports the work that we're doing, all right? So thank you very much tonight. I'll see you in a week. Pick up a flyer if you'd like it.